thank you for joining our Be Women weekly webinars to connect, to share, to learn what is important to us. We are going through very challenging times, we know that, uh, that give us a unique opportunity to reflect, to reimagine our future, to discover our authentic personality and where we want to go or to be professionally. Our webinar will be like 50 minutes, Biomimicry Thinking of Resilient and Regenerative Business. You are in for an amazing insight from Claire Jenish. She is the founding director of South Africa. And the moderator will be Jessica Berliner, researcher and learning designer at Re uh, uh, Rewild Africa. Two amazing women who spend their time exploring nature's genius in diverse ecosystems, translating nature's innovation and sustainability principles for the design of new products, process, processes, and systems. I am Maria Belen Barroso from Argentina, living in Spain, in Malaga, proposed driven communication advisor and researcher, advisory board member of Be Women Solution, and passionate about of using business and communication as a force for good to address issues on inequality, gender, and climate emergency. Be Women Solution, who are we? We are a global network of women entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs that seeks to balance purpose and profits in the market toward a caring economy. What is the caring economy? An economic system in which we generally care of the well-being of people and respect and responsibility of our environment. We create awareness and inspire specific and measurable actions regarding the two burning issues of our society, gender and climate action. We collaborate as a network of thousands of women and also men to leave behind traditional econo economies of very few winner winners, winners and only a few, uh, a lot of losers, sorry, and move toward the long-term vision of creating value on the caring economy. A few seconds more, before I pass the line to Jessica and Claire, let me share the Be Women Empowerment Movement. So you can feel the energy and get you inspired for action. So you need to move your shoulders back, your chin up, your gaze up, make your eyes twinkle with joy and determination, and a wide smile that illuminates everyone around you. We know that smiling is good for the soul. With this great smile, Claire and Jessica, this line is all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Belen. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, everybody. It's absolutely wonderful to be here. And what a wonderful group of women. This is so inspiring. So I feel like the smiling shoulders thing comes naturally now. This is so exciting. <laughs> um, so yes, hello, I'm Jess. I live in Cape Town in South Africa. Um, as Belen said, I work as a learning designer and researcher uh, with Three Wild Africa and also managing director and co-founder of a company called Learn by Mimicry, which you'll hear more about later. And I would just very briefly like to introduce my dear friend and colleague and mentor, Claire Janish, um, who is, as Belen mentioned, the founding director of Biomimicry South Africa. Um, Claire was a graduate of the first cohort of Biomimicry professionals to be trained by the Biomimicry 3.8 um, and Institute. Um, and she is actually a lead trainer as well for the Biomimicry Professional Certificate Program. Um, and since Starting then, she has been working absolutely energetically in this field by mimicry for 10 years plus, I think. Um, and you probably know her either from training or from lectures or from research and consulting or from expeditions. Claire is absolutely tireless. <laughs> um, so she knows this field absolutely inside out, end to end. And with that, I would actually just like to hand straight over to Claire. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, hello, everybody. It's so nice to see so many faces from around the world. I know some of you. Um, I don't know all of you. Um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background um, why I came to biomimicry in the first place. And uh, I actually studied chemical engineering. So not in the field of business, but in the field of the people who make um, a lot of what business makes. And in a field which makes the biggest mess, as far as I'm concerned, because we're responsible for making um, single-use plastics, for refining oil, for um, making pesticides and herbicides and all the toxic chemicals that end up in our environment. And we're responsible for making um, food in ways that are not natural as well. So 
it's a huge thing that I chose to do. I chose to dive into the field that was the most destructive in order to figure out if we could turn that field around and have a beneficial impact on, on the world. Um, and for the first 10 years, I worked in sustainable business. I did a master's in, in cleaner production and waste minimization. And I even was responsible for writing the UN Global Compact with a few other colleagues and got deeply interested in um, understanding how to transform business. And strangely enough, it brought me straight back into understanding how to transform the very processes that business runs on, um, that the things that we make, um, the things that we do. And in 1997, signed up for a biomimicry edition, no, 2007. So 1997, the book Biomimicry was written and I did read it with passion. In 2007, signed up for an expedition in the Amazon rainforest with Janine Venus and Dana Baumeister, seeking to learn biomimicry. Um, and in that one week of an expedition, completely transformed my worldview, completely transformed my capacity to see how we could change the way we design our world. And was so moved and so inspired that I signed up for the first cohort of biomimicry professionals where we studied biology, engineering, design, and business over two years. And we visited six different ecosystems around the world. And was so moved by that, that I was um, signed up to be the engineering facilitator for the next cohort. So I've done it twice, once as a, as a learner and once as a teacher, and then have worked to grow biomimicry in the world um, with my biggest passion of reorienting our entire focus of human design, whether it's business or products or processes, to wrap that around life. Um, so often we find how life works and then we try and put a business case onto it. Um, I'm trying to find what is the business case for life itself. I'm trying to find instead of how to make a process less bad and slightly greener with zero emissions, I'm trying to make processes the way nature makes processes. And that's really my passion. And so what I'm interested today in sharing with you today is the potential for us to look at um, biomimicry, not from, not from the perspective of, of um, what it is, but the big why. Like, why do we do it? Um, and that to me is of, of big, big interest. Um, why do we even think about doing it in business? Um, and, and so I'm not going to have time to take you into the depth of the what is biomimicry, into the depth of how we even do biomimicry. I'm just going to really highlight the big whys and the big whys and why it's relevant for business today, because this is the theme. Um, I just want to also make one major point is that um, I've always been asked, what's it like to be a woman engineer? And to me, being an engineer is a no-brainer, easy peasy. I can do anything I put my mind to. But I don't want to be an engineer that is equal to a male. I want to be an engineer that brings a unique feminine perspective into the world of engineering. And I believe that my deep love of life and my deep care and nourishing um, and nurturing of life that all of us women have is something that I choose to bring into the world of engineering. I choose to bring that woman's perspective of how do we nourish life in everything we do combine that with the capacity of what engineers can do and put the two together to have a whole new way of doing engineering. And similarly, a whole new way of doing business, a whole new way of doing economics. So I really just think that women so often try to be um, taken to a level where they're equal to men. And I think actually I, I have a unique perspective that is, it is not equal. It's actually unique and it's beautiful. And I would like to bring my different perspective into that world and that nourishing life is actually the, the deep perspective that I think the feminine has to bring into the world. Um, so let me, let me just take you through some, some deep principles um, behind why biomimicry is relative to business, re relevant to business. And I love this term, think outside, that was coined by the Biomimicry Institute because it's, it's really reminding us that we have an opportunity to not just think outside the box with biomimicry, but to think way outside the box. And um, not only that, but to use nature itself um, outside um, as our inspiration for rethinking and redesigning our world. So recently, um, in April this year, Forbes brought out this article on Learn Biomimicry, the online course to work on during lockdown. And they said it's a timely program to embark on whilst considering what the future holds in a post-pandemic society. This program could help in navigating our way through this intense period of change to help us reshape our lives, mimicking the systems of nature itself. And this is something so deep to my heart, firstly, because I actually was partly responsible for bringing this Learn Biomimicry course to life, but also because it, it really is what I think right now, the exact um, pressures that we as business and society are under because of this pandemic are exactly the pressures that we need 
to push us to recognizing how potent um, nature is in helping us to solve our challenges. And hopefully you'll get the same perspective by, by the end of this. If any of you have never heard the term biomimicry, I just want to highlight that it, it means to copy nature, but not just to copy it for um, with, without deeper understanding. It's, it's a deliberate and conscious attempt to understand how nature manages to have all these organisms and ecosystems thriving um, for four billion years with no unemployment in nature and no waste. And how do we actually generate a world that functions like nature? Um, how do we learn from nature, translate those principles, those recipes, those strategies to be more successful, um, to be better um, species on this planet ourselves, to be well adapted, but also to be able to function like the natural world in the way that it is both regenerative, constantly nourishing the, the earth itself, but also in a way that is able to adapt to change all the time, which is where the resilience comes in. So yes, you can apply bi biomimicry to shapes um, and forms and come up with really cool biomimicry gadgets that are far more efficient than we've ever seen. Um, yes, you can um, apply biomimicry to recipes and processes and come up with life-friendly chemistry and new materials. Um, but where I see the greatest potency for biomimicry is if we apply it to whole systems, where we can redesign the systems of our world, not just make them slightly better, but transform them in ways that are actually able to achieve all our functional needs, but do it in a way that's truly um, regenerative to our earth, regenerative to people, um, truly effective in its attempt to nourish what really matters in this world. So for so long, we've just been going ahead and doing business and doing engineering and doing design separate from life. And now life is saying, hold on, we can't continue this way. Figure out how life works and figure out how to make business, design, engineering, everything work in a way that functions like life. And biomimicry as a field has over the last few decades distilled the methodologies, the principles and successful results, um, truly just helping the rest of the world to understand the power of this process and, and actually distilling it in a way that's it's simple to do. So I don't have time to, in the short presentation to take you through the big systemic um, principles for if we applied these principles to the way we designed our world, to the way we did business. I'm just going to mention that they exist and they're called biomimicry's life principles. And if you're keen on understanding them and learning them, they are the best sustainability principles you could ever come across as someone who's worked in the field of sustainability for two decades. They are the best innovation principles I've ever come across. They are the best systems thinking principles I've ever come across. And they are the best principles for helping you constantly navigate a world of rapid change and complexity. And what's interesting is those same principles work in every one of those fields. Um, which is extraordinary because as business and, and as leaders in business, it's very difficult for us to figure out how to navigate complexity. So if we're given a set of principles that really just apply to almost every one of the complex issues we, we're dealing with today is, is really exciting for me. So instead of me taking you into these principles, instead of me taking you in depth into them, what I'm going to do is just highlight some of them, just pop them for you um, so you can get an understanding of why I think they're so, so, so important for, for business today. So the first one I want to draw your attention to is the ability to be able to constantly change, um, adapt to change, to be attuned to change, and to be able to um, navigate through complexity. And this image is taken from the nature of business. But what it draws my attention to is this idea that for so long we've been able to manage our world um, through very orderly hierarchical processes. You know, we run business like that. We run, we design master plans for cities like that. We run education like that. Um, we try and order our lives, you know, by, by breaking it into parts and putting it into boxes and, and treating it like a machine. But the real world is not like that. It's easy to do that when you have very few people, when you have very slow rates of change, when you have um, far less complexity, but it doesn't work when we're in the world that we're in today, in the context we're in today. And many of you will realize that business looks far more like the picture on the right. And Definitely um, post COVID or during COVID, you just can imagine that the complexity we have to understand, that's just in navigating, understanding how people work together. But then the impact that your business has on 
social issues, economic issues, environmental issues, and how they're all interwoven and the um, externalities that your business has and the things you have to understand and the impacts and where you play. That's the complexity we're playing in. And we really need to function in a way that navigates that complexity, that works with that complexity and works in a way that moves towards the world we want and not just constantly firefighting and moving towards a world we don't want. So this ability to navigate in complexity and to maintain stability and dynamic change is called agility or being attuned and responsive. An interesting McKinsey report recently said that companies in more volatile or uncertain environments are more likely than others to pursue agile transformations. And you might've heard the word agile before. And this Forbes article says why agile is the mindset to get us through the COVID crisis. So the last point I want to make about agility is that respondents in agile units are more likely to report financial outperformance and non-financial measures by one and a half to 1.7 times. So this means that agility doesn't only help you to navigate through complexity and specifically difficult times, it also gives you the capacity to have better performance as well. So what has agility got to do with biomimicry? Well, the same McKinsey report says that the five trademarks of agile organizations are actually trademarks of an organism. And they said that we need to move away from moving from organizations that function as machines, which is that hierarchical, top-down, bureaucratic, siloed way of being, to working as organisms that, uh, organizations that function more like organisms, able to have quick changes, flexible resources, um, focus on action, less on boxes. Uh, it's just an extraordinary recognition that we, we need to function more like organisms because organisms know how to navigate this kind of complexity and know how to perform better in these times of complex change. So the, um, this graph really just shows you about the relative um, between the relation between dynamic, being able to adapt to change quickly, but still maintain stability. And the thing about bureaucracy, which is what a lot of business is stuck in, especially government um, as a business, and especially um, a lot of places which most need to change right now they 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 don't want to change because they've got a lot of startup kind of mindset not only startups love the dynamism but they don't have that stability so agile allows you to have both that dynamism and the stability at the same time and as you study nature and you study how organisms and particularly super organisms function you'll find they have this capacity to constantly maintain that agility that balance between dynamism and stability and if you dive deep into how, um, and it, you'll find things like swarm intelligence come into being and self-organization, how nature uses simple rules to navigate through complexity. Um, and there's a wonderful organization called BioTeams, which is helping people, especially today, um, manage virtual network business teams by extracting those principles from how organisms manage to navigate in, in complexity, but also how super organisms can communicate. Um, just to give you a sense of what those principles are without going in depth into them, um, this thing of swarm intelligence is how individuals in a swarm, like fish or bees or birds, are not as intelligent as when they become these collective beings, these swarms or flocks or schools of fish. They are able to rapidly communicate with each other and as a team, be able to perform in a way that's way more than the sum of the parts. And one of my favorite examples of this is ants, the way they're able to navigate to find um, resources and, and come back. There's no um, chief ant, there's no president ant, there's no traffic policeman ant who's directing all the ants in a hierarchical way and trying to create order out of the seeming chaos of ants everywhere trying to find food. What they do is they navigate in the environment using simple feedback loops. So the ants leave the nest and when they find a resource, as they return, the ones that have found a resource leave a very clear feedback loop, a very clear signal on the ground that says, hey, I've found food here. Um, if you're leaving the nest, follow this trail, you're more likely to find food. And so they follow the trail and in the shortest period of time, the shortest route gets reinforced by all the other ants. And so therefore the shortest route becomes the strongest smelling route, which means as all the ants leave, they then follow the shortest route. Um, that kind of ability to self-organize um, order in, in what seeming like, seems like chaos is what we need to do in business today. Interestingly, there's a whole field called ant colony optimization. Um, and with one student that 
was in the University of Johannesburg in South Africa, just applying that, that theory of ant colony optimization to optimizing logistics, not, not even people, but just the routes that the post office vehicles were moving, managed to reduce those routes by up to 50% and save the company that amount of diesel and amount of money as well in costs. So the power for us to, to think like superorganisms hasn't been called on before, and now it's asking us to do that. And we actually apply this type of swarm intelligence and this type of algorithm every day when we use the Waze app. And I'm sure many of you have used it. It's individual, not ants in this case, but humans rapidly communicating with each other through a platform that enables us to smell um, those pheromones or see the, the shortest routes actually now turned into a visual dashboard. And we can rapidly navigate through our traffic by using this same type of swarm intelligence theory. Now, wouldn't it be cool if you had a Waze app type of space for you to enable all of your people in your organization to communicate and, and move through space and whatever they're trying to do, or even manage logistics. And that's kind of where that agility in nature, that capacity to be attuned and responsive um, is really an amazing lesson that we can learn from nature. And I could only highlight, you know, with those examples. What I really want to point out too is that the same principles that enables stability and dynamism also enables resilience. And one of the critical ones is, is the capacity to be distributed. Um, and all of nature systems are inherently distributed. You'll see the platforms that I just talked about, the internet is distributed and colony optimization is distributed. You'll find patterns in nature of distribution everywhere. And once you found them, you understand and you understand why nature uses them. It's very hard for us in biomimicry to ever think of systems in any other ways as actually being effective because distributed systems are highly resilient. If I show you this image, the centralized system, all the nodes are connected to one central node. Now that's lovely if you want extreme order, but as I said, with bureaucracy, it doesn't give you a lot of dynamism. It also makes you extremely fragile because if that is a centralized power plant in a city and it fails for whatever reason, the entire city is without power. If it is a centralized dam in a city like the city of Cape Town, that dam runs out of water, everybody's without water. If it's a company or a government um, that is centralized that makes decisions on behalf of everybody, if that government fails, everybody else fails. It's a highly fragile space to be in. If you move towards decentralized, yes, it gives you a little bit more stability and, 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 and as well as dynamism, but still, if you needed to move from the bottom right to the top left, you still have to go through central nodes. And if there's a problem there, you, have a, you, you, you still can't move. So what we're looking in nature is, is we find that their systems are distributed. And what we mean by distributed is that every node is connected to every other node, which means that there's multiple pathways that can be chosen, multiple potentials, which gives you this resilience and change. And it also gives you the dynamism that you're looking for. We understand that pattern when we look at social media, things like Facebook, the internet looks like that. But we need to start to move to a point where business management looks like that, where infrastructure and cities looks like that. And even to a point where government and policy starts looking like this, where the entire individuals in the system are contributing like a swarm to collective decision making and, and also enabling rapid response in times of change and dynamic response in times of change. So distributed systems, a critical element of resilience. There needs to be a lot of diversity in those as well. But also distributed systems is what we need to move towards in economics, because at the moment it's concentrated centrally to 1%, right? Um, and a body that tries to concentrate all its flows into one part tends to start to die, whereas a, a body that's distributing all the nutrients throughout the whole system is far healthier. Um, we need to start looking at distribution as a principle um, for so many reasons. So just putting that out there to start with. What's interesting also, in terms of dynamism, in terms of dynamic change, in terms of resilience, right now we have this movement in the world to this fourth industrial revolution. And to me, the fourth industrial revolution is all about moving towards a distributed system. Okay, we had this pre-industrial revolution of all these artisans working separately. Then they realized they could be more effective if they worked together. So then they worked together in a centralized way. But the moment we became digitized, we have now got the capacity to us to work together as a centralized superorganism, but not in a centralized space. And we can have this dynamism that we see from, from the internet. And you'll find that the so-called winning organizations today, the exponential organizations are the ones that are functioning 
because they're able to function from this distributed platform. You know what Netflix is about, you know what Uber is about. You just have to think of Airbnb. It's, it's distributed resources of buildings and homes and rooms around the world that collectively um, communicate using a platform so that they can share those resources. Um, that's what makes them so effective and so sustainable in, the, in, in many different ways. The other major thing we need to recognize is that right now we have exponential technologies that are driving this exponential um, change in this exponential organizations. And what's interesting for us to point out is that this, these exponential technologies that are driving the fourth industrial revolution, that are driving change at a rate that we are unable to navigate because we are used to linear change and slow bureaucratic you know, stability type of systems. What I really wanted to point out is these exponential technologies that everyone talks about that are really surprising us because we're not expecting this level of change. Every single one of them is actually biomimicry, which is it's another critical thing for us to be aware of. Why is it that right now we are having to adapt to change, but that change that we are adapting to is actually a very biomimetic change. So let's see what I'm talking about, right? We hear about artificial intelligence and AI and deep learning and neural networks. Every one of those is mimicking human intelligence or other intelligence. So it's people understanding how the brain works and copying those principles to develop computers and systems and software that can do that. Okay. We hear about robots. What are robots? But mimicking human or other organisms capacities. We hear about drones, but what is a drone if it's not a clumsy, lightweight, distributed ability to navigate and, and distribute resources, right? Exactly what we find in nature. We hear about the internet of things and smart sensors. So what is your body if it's not five super smart sensors connected to a central nervous system, which is like the internet of things? And we are starting to understand how to make those more effective by studying central nervous systems and the sense of, of, of other organisms as well. We hear about digital platforms and the blockchain, which is actually swarm intelligence applied to humans, the ability to rapidly communicate and distribute and, and exchange value on a network scale. And we need data storage on a mass scale to manage all this information. We have these huge warehouses that store data and they need a lot of energy to keep them cool. And we're finding that the field of biomimicry is saying, hold on, how does DNA store information? And as they research it, they find that we can actually store all the world's data on less than one kilogram of DNA and a few grams of, of biological DNA in the tube will actually replace a million square foot data center. Um, what's fascinating for me about DNA is it's stable at room temperature. So it doesn't need cooling and it lasts for up to 400,000 years. So the capacity for us to start to be exponential in the way we do things is going to have to radically turn to nature and figure out how nature is able to store that information. And then we hear about nanotechnology as exponential technologies. Well, the more you do biomimicry, the more you realize that nanotechnology is not a few decades old, it's actually millions of years old. Um, we'll find organisms that have been exploiting the nano level for, for millions of years. And as we start to reverse engineer those, we find how nature does nanotech super um, things for, for achieving functions we want to achieve, but also how nature uses nanotechnology um, in ways that are totally safe for life. And we have to learn how to do that as well. And then we have additive manufacturing and 3D printing. Well, nature's been manufacturing cell by cell or, or from the bottom up for millions of years. And we're starting to learn how nature does that and apply that to the way we design our world. We'll get into that more. Sending blueprints instead of actual products so that things can be manufactured locally. Um, that's kind of what nature does with seeds as well. So interesting idea for how we can do that in more safe, environmentally friendly ways. And then we have sustainable energy, one of the exponential technologies everyone's fascinated by. And as much as I love sustainable energy and it's a far greater leap than fossil fuels, we still have a lot to learn from nature and how to do sustainable energy. Because that solar panel is still made using highly toxic chemistry, um, processes that you do not want to work in or manage the environmental impacts of. It uses a lot of carbon. Um, fossil fuels actually make those solar panels to start with, so actually emitting carbon while making them. And when their solar panels life is over, they end up in, in waste dumps and landfill sites. Whereas if you compare nature's solar panels, which is a leaf, it um, uses carbon as a raw material, breathes in carbon, turns it into this amazing life-friendly polymer interspersed with the capacity to capture the sun's energy. While doing that, it breathes out oxygen, 
nourishing the cocktail of gases that sustain life. It's driven by vapor transpiration, which drives the rainfall and brings rain and contributes to the water cycle. And when its life is over, it ends up as compost building the soil. We have such a possibility to um, generate a world where we can actually achieve sustainable energy by actually starting to understand how nature does it in a way that nourishes life. And that's really important for me. So as much as all of these exponential technologies are biomimetic and understanding how to copy nature to achieve these exponential technologies will be a critical skill, what I want to point out is what's missing from all of these exponential technologies right now is the wisdom of nature and how nature manages to achieve these high-tech, extraordinary capacities and functions, but doing it in a way that actually nourishes life, that is life-friendly, that is regenerative in every step. And that's the part that I think is critical for us in the world of business to get right. Otherwise, we will have a world that is pure technology that might mimic all of nature, but does not produce oxygen, that does not build soil, that does not clean water, in fact, does the very opposite. So we have this moment as COVID, we have the great pause, where we see how happy nature is to be left alone. Um, is the height of human achievement us doing nothing um, at all, which is highly, highly sad? Or could we become one of those welcome species in the natural world and actually start to study how nature manages to make these high-tech functions that we're trying to achieve, but do it in a way that is truly nourishing to life? So that's the four billion years of experience that nature has. That's the wisdom I'm really thinking we need to bring in the world of business. We hear about it. We hear about triple bottom line. We hear about managing um, a world without climate change. But how do we actually achieve that? And so these 3D printing technologies, what if we use them to be more distributed, to mimic nature's forms, but to create more the capacity for, for manufacturing locally, using, using um, people locally and local communities and distributing wealth effectively, um, radically changing away from a globalist centralized system that is concentrating money to the few because only few can afford it. What if we change the recipes, the way we made those products and processes to use life-friendly chemistry? What if we achieved the extraordinary, um, the most heavy um, industries in, in, in our human world are things like mining, which extract heavy metals and, and things like ironing, mining for steel, um, which we use in almost everything, and even aluminum. This spider has the capacity to make a product that is tougher than steel. Um, more flexible than nylon, better than Kevlar, um, and yet it makes it using water and dead insects at the temperature of the cold-blooded spider. How can we copy those recipes and start to make materials without that huge impact of mining, without that huge impact, and be able to 3D print with that material? Well, there's a company in Japan that's understood how the spinnerets in the back of the spider and the recipe of the spiders will come together to create an extraordinary functional material, and that company is called Fiber, and they've actually managed to a protein-based material that they've used in everything from the Moon Parker North Face to a, a shock-absorbing chair. We are achieving the capacity to make life-friendly materials that are, can replace some of the most degenerative industries in our world today. If you combine spider silk with chitin, you get a plastic that is biodegradable and biocompatible. And if it ends up in the ocean, it's food um, for species. And we have a plastic on our breathing in carbon, like this company Novum, that turns carbon dioxide using the catalyst that you find in lemon peel into a plastic that actually is sequestering carbon and turning carbon into a raw material like all of, all of nature does. And Ford is now using those plastics in its, in its car parts. And as a chemical engineer, I really have to highlight that I have studied now with various other biomimics. There are five or so major abundant materials that nature uses that I reckon could replace almost every single material that we use today. And that would actually enable us to be um, making all of our materials in a way that are truly regenerative to nature. So the last point I want to bring us to is this idea of where are we actually evolving to? Because one of the things in the life's principles, how do we evolve to survive as a species? Um, and just a snapshot, this is a, an image of South Africa's river systems. And the red indicates those that are in poor condition and the blue those that are in healthy condition. And you'll find that this is the case across many, many countries that we just are growing and developing as a species, but we're doing it in a way that's actually killing the lifeblood of our planet. And it's so obvious when I show it to you as a river system, it's very <coughs> complex if I explain it to you as climate change and 
two degrees. And, but this is just really in your face, right? And then we have the United Nations Environmental Program doing analysis and said, actually, none of the world's top industries would actually be profitable if they paid for the natural capital they use. And half the reason why we are destroying the environment as we grow is because we're not accounting. We're not truly accounting for the costs of all of this thing. Like what is life and what is it truly worth? Um, and if we put an exponential curve, you know, the speed at which we grow right now with exponential technologies and exponential business onto that destructive pathway, we will have a disaster for humanity. But if we took that exponential curve, those exponential technologies and combined them with the regenerative wisdom of nature, we have the potential to take that exponential change and curve that speed of change towards being regenerative. And that's really where I see the greatest potential for us to move away from this 20th century economics of growth at all costs, which is like a cancer that grows while destroying its, its, its host towards the 21st century economics that Kate Raworth is so um, um, powerful in expressing. One that recognizes that we should design an economy that's um, around thriving and not around growing. And what does healthy growth look like? And um, she looks to nature for her inspiration and says, well, we, the nature thrives within boundaries and those boundaries are both social and ecological and we've already overshot all of them. So now we need to think about what does economics look like in that type of context. And interestingly, she says we should use biology again as our guide um, and move towards systems that are both distributed, which is what I've been talking about in biomimicry, and regenerative, which is also what I've been saying. So moving to these circular economies that are distributed is going to be critical for our human species. And so what if our model for the way we design business, the way we design economies, the way we design engineering, the way we design industry was a forest or a thriving, mature ecosystem? that is both distributed and resilient and regenerative at the same time. Now, how do we shift that take, make, waste, dispose linear economy to a circular economy, not where the technical nutrients are separate from the biological nutrients, but our technical nutrients are made using biological wisdom and they are just as nourishing to the environment as the biological ones. And so this fourth industrial revolution combined with that regenerative thinking, I think is the most inspiring place we could be as humanity to really steer us into a, into a world that is so exciting, um, as opposed to one that could be highly destructive. So to end, I wanted to point you to this book, which is written by a colleague of mine, um, Thames and Willie Barkers, saying, how do superorganisms, things like ants and swarms, build infinite wealth in a finite world? And she agrees with all of what's been said before. Their secret is they build their compounding, compounding wealth on infinite things. Why are they infinite? Because they cycled continuously in regenerative ways but also on distributed systems through the complexity and diversity of interconnected networks. And you guys in, in Be Women will really understand the power of networks and the power of distributed networks as well. So what builds resilient and regenerative immune systems, which is what we really need to understand now with COVID-19, are exactly the same principles that build regenerative and resilient ecosystems which are exactly the same principles of what builds regenerative and resilient business and are exactly the same principles that build resilient and regenerative society. And if you really take your time to study biomimic at the level of the systems, at the level of life's principles, you'll see that you have the capacity to do this yourself, to actually apply these amazing principles in the design of your business. So it's very high level um, presentation, just the why not a lot of detail but if you are interested in learning more you can go to learnbiomimicry.com where myself and Jessica and friends at Rewild have distilled um, what is biomimicry and how do you do it into the into one level biomimicry life principles into another level and then the last level which is biomimicry masterclass is this vision of what the world could be like if we actually applied biomimicry to everything from our economic systems to our water systems to our energy systems to our material systems to agriculture to city design and a vision of what's possible if we actually were to achieve it. So thank you very much. Um, oh, just one last thing. If you're interested in learning biomimicry in person, you can come on safaris with us as well, but we'll chat about that more. But thank you very much um, for your time. And I'm, I'm here to answer questions now. Jess? Oh, amazing, as always. Thank you, Claire. <laughs> sure. Um, Berlin, would you like to um, say anything before we jump into some uh, questions and answers here? No, no, I'm, I'm absolutely inspired by you, Claire. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, you know that I'm a fan of biomimicry. 
And I have some questions uh, similar to the, the chat Zoom. So Jess, please, if you could read it, because I think that we all have the same question. How to apply biomimicry without being a, a biological, scientific, or a, a, if you don't know about too much about nature. So that's the question. And Jessica, please, if you could read it. So thank you. Thank you, Claire. And thank you, Jessica. Fantastic. Thank you, Belen. Um, tour de force, Claire. <laughs> Amazing. Um, I don't know about anybody else. I went with a bunch of questions, but um, the question from Sandra was, she was saying she would love to uh, understand how I could apply or work with biomimicry without a deeper knowledge of how nature is working or functioning. And this was on the back of, you know, do you need to have a kind of a science or biology background? So. Yeah, definitely answer that question. Yeah. Um, what's interesting is I think this is so interesting. I studied chemical engineering. I did a master's in chemical engineering and I did not study biology or how life worked at school at all. And there's a heck of a lot of people in the world who have no clue how life works and they go on and they design a world that is causing destruction to life. So my first thought was, Jesus, my goodness, we should be having how life works as a number one class in school and all the way through in university, no matter what you study. But my second point of call is, is to say that, yes, I had no clue how biology worked either. And actually the purpose of biomimicry is to bring the disciplines back together again. And so we work with biologists. Um, I didn't really know how to do design other than engineering design. So we work with designers and I didn't actually have a, a specific focus in business. So we work with the business um, fields as well. So biomimicry is so interesting because it takes these separated siloed um, disciplines and brings them back together. And actually, all that it really is, is a, a translation process. And you learn how to define your language in a way that makes sense to different fields, but also to, to turn your language of your field into nature's language so that you can search in the biological references for, for answers. Um, and also, you don't have to do it. You can also hire biomimics to do it with you. But if you are interested in learning, as I said, go to learnbiomimicry.com. The, the steps are all there. Um, it actually is so simple. Um, ask Jessica, she'll tell you. It's one of the simplest methodologies. It just has such a deep and profound impact once you've learned it. Fantastic, thank you. Um, yeah, there's so many things that, well, I know we have limited time and you just kind of want to go down into these little rabbit holes of uh, explanations and more conversation. But I think that something that's quite important to just highlight from the kind of the methodology side of things um, is that biomimicry is really, we're looking, we're learning from nature instead of about nature. So you really don't need to know anything about it <laughs> because what we're really doing is we're actually distilling the function and we're learning from it. So what is it actually doing? Not what it is. Um, and you know, what it is, all of those nouns kind of almost fall away in the end. Um, and we really go with function and that sort of starts to speak to the, the bridging aspect that Claire was talking about. Um, so I don't know, Claire, if you would like to expand any more on that. And then just the other thing is that in biomimicry practice, as Claire said, you know, it's really quite interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary. So what we really push is this idea of reconnection as well. So you're not only connecting to yourself and connecting to nature, but we're actually connecting our disciplines back together because they actually need to function together. And this is kind of, you know, Claire was speaking about the, the system side of things. Um, and, you know, you can really only start achieving the sort of like system level transformations when we actually are more connected. Um, Claire, I don't know if you want to expand on that at all. Otherwise yeah, I'd love to remind, yeah, the reminder of learning, uh, not learning about nature, it's learning from nature. And, uh, just shifting that, just shifting that perspective is, is such a humble perspective to have. Um, and then you start learning from nature, you start having this amazing recognition of the genius and wisdom in it and that starts to shift that reconnection um hold on i am nature i am part of nature oh my goodness that's not just a tree that's a solar panel rain making machine that breathes oxygen and builds soil oh my goodness imagine we could do that so that's that that moment of just saying what can i learn from nature is, is actually the very first step you do when you start to apply biomimicry um, another, so, sorry, Jessica, another tool that we have, I think, is Ask Nature. No? It's a platform from Biomimicry Institute where you can find, for example, some ideas 
to apply biomimicry, thinking in some species, some processes, or some ecosystem. So it's a good, very, very useful platform. I don't know if you could tell about us. Thank you, Claire. Yeah, askblake.org is a is a like a reorganization of biology textbooks into a digital textbook. But instead of having one on marine biology and one on microbiology and one on cellular biology, they reordered them around what is nature actually doing. So under how does nature filter water or how does nature self-organize, you'd find everything from a bacteria to a cell to a, a whale to a flamingo. <laughs> so that's the idea of how do we actually take this biological genius and wisdom and sort it into a format that's on one website that anybody can access um, for free and to find the answers they're looking for. So I do highly recommend it, asknature.org. You don't have to do the work when the work's done for you, basically. I have a quick question uh, for you, uh, Claire. First of all, thank you so much for, for this uh, presentation. I, it's, it's the first time that it crystallized in my head what I kind of almost knew intuitively. I didn't know that this practice kind of existed. So it's, it's, uh, it's really great to hear about it. I've always believed that in life, um, in order to be connected, you need to, uh, to develop two things, one connection to yourself and two connection to nature. And I didn't actually realize that there was some, <laughs> some, a, a whole level of, uh, of, of, of wisdom that could be applied to business uh, in this regard. So thank you for making that uh, link. I just want to ask you, you mentioned a couple of, um, well, a number of technology firms and that they are distributed and connected and so on. Yet in terms of their practices and how they kind of deal with the world, they don't embody the uh, sort of the, you know, the kind of the rhythm of nature and this regenerative kind of idea that you talked about. How do we reconcile that? And, and, what, and, and I guess that's one question. And the second question, are there uh, really well-known companies that you know of that embody those two aspects, uh, you know, the regenerative, regenerative and the distributive uh, that yeah. you can talk about? Very good questions. I, I honestly going to tell you that my biggest fear for humanity right now is this to total belief that technology will solve our problems. You know, that, that one where led by the Singularity University and led by this exponential technology, that's all we need and we'll solve all our problems. And this, this potential that, oh, we'll just digitize everything to the point where we'll replace our brains with microchips and connect to some artificial intelligence thing. That to me is the most dystopian future I could ever imagine for humanity because it is the very connection to breathing oxygen and drinking water and you know connecting to soil and food that I think is what makes us so beautifully human and makes life so wonderful so the capacity for us to lead a dramatic change like humanity is going this way and say don't go that way take all that cool stuff that you love that genius those amazing organizations you think are so exciting add a layer of the divine feminine wisdom of nourishing life, add that onto that, and then we have an amazing win. But if you just have the one without the other, you don't. Um, the one company that I see is doing some extraordinary thing is a company called Interface. They do make um, carpets, which is strange, but um, they set the target of being the first regenerative um, company in the world. And I've visited their, their factories and they they don't have something that says waste on the sign. It says food, you know, they treat everything they make as, as, as food and the potential to be reorganized. They're now building a factory in Australia that is functioning the same way as the local ecosystem, giving back as much as the local ecosystem. So they're really winning on the regenerative side. There's also a bit of resilience built in and that they sell modular carpets, which means you can constantly change and adapt your <laughs> system as you go. Um, and I think because they're prepared to adapt their own business function around service instead of around the product, they also have the potential to be resilient. I'd say they're the closest um, I've come across. But I think there's a potential if you took the best 3D printing additive manufacturing capacity in the world and you combined it with the best biochemistry type of capacity in the world and you put those together with a swarm intelligence of digital blueprints for how we can make everything I think that interface, I think a company built around that would be the most exciting company to be around right now because it's the way we extract and make things is the hugest impact we have. If we could change that, we, we suddenly can take the forms of nature and combine it into a system that really works. Yeah. 
Nice. Um, can I quickly grab some more questions from the chat? Is that cool? Yep, cool. Um, so Rebecca was asking, uh, did you find a lot of pushback when trying to share your passion for new biomimicry principles and systems as a woman in your chemical engineering profession? And any tips for how to bring about this level of change uh, when there will be pushback? <laughs> you know what I've, I've found with biomimicry? Well, first of all, as a chemical engineer, I've been taught to think very logically and use science to back up my thinking, right? I'm not standing as a hippie going, I think we should love nature. I'm like, I've seen how you make this process. That's how you make fertilizers. This is how you make chemical. I now see that nature makes it in this way. These are the principles by which you can achieve it. And this is how you translate it. And this is how you get there. That is hurt. You know, it's a, it's a different, like, Hey, I think you should do a better job. It's like, this is how you do a better job and I'll help you get there. Um, I found every time I presented in the field of, of chemical engineering, they've loved it. And they've been like, Oh my goodness. And, and a lot of student chemical engineers who are like lost in soul's depth in the disaster of Mordor that chemical engineering actually has, come to me and say, Oh goodness me. Thank you for giving me a potential for me to take my field and actually have an impact on the world. That's it's beneficial. So I haven't had pushback to tell you the truth. And it's the art of communication. It's the art of, of making connections that biomimicry brings those bridges that I think is what makes it so successful as a field. Mm. Um, <laughs> brilliant. Um, I think there's, there's some re really interesting points coming up as well around um, ethics, truth, and what I really want to go loop back to as well is the idea of ethos in biomimicry and the idea of nature as a mentor. Um, you know, I think you know, there, there was another question in here as well, kind of looking at, you know, what is the sort of the intent behind this kind of design? And I, I would love to hear your thoughts on that um, as well as the idea of like this, the, the, of nourishing life and of this kind of the care economy and if you're doing right by one thing chances are you're doing right by another um yeah. so yeah i'd love to hear your thoughts on that yeah often ethics comes up against the either or thing oh i'd love to do that and be all nourishing to life but i have to keep business and keep people employed or i'd love to do that but it won't work and what i love about biomimicry it gives you that both and possibility Yes, you can have amazing development and growth, not, not no growth, which, you know, we must end all growth, which is what the sustainability world says. Yes, you can have growth, but instead of cancerous growth, you have forest-like growth, forest-like growth that is regenerative. Um, so we did a lot of work recently in a, in a development around the airports um, at Aerotropolis, and we we were working with the conflict between the environmentalists who didn't want the development to happen, which was the ethos of like, we must nourish life and, you know, put a green line and nobody must come here. And the developers who said, we are living in an impoverished country and nobody's got money and we have to provide jobs. And those are just bash, bash, bash and no result. And we said, but what if your development functioned like the natural world? What if your, your development actually nourished the ecosystems, provided ecosystem services? What if it actually, you were a welcome species and was generous in the way you developed, then you could have both end. And what does that look like? And, What's interesting is it has to be more distributed. And if, when it is more distributed, it means it's more inclusive and you have more social benefits. So it's not concentrating the wealth in a few. And suddenly by applying biomimicry, you no longer have ethos, ethics versus business. You suddenly find a place where the two work really well together. And that is, and people who love, you know, non-flict and solving conflict, to me, it's just so thrilling to actually have those moments. And we got to a point where the environmentalists said, um, we're so excited that we actually found a solution that took these global issues and brought it down to a local level and showed us what was possible. And the developers were like, oh my goodness, we can actually develop in a way that's nourishing that does show us how. And we came up with new standards for how the city could be designed in a, in a different way. So what I'm saying is ethos is lovely in principle. And everyone was like, I deeply care about this, but I've got to get on with business. You know, you've got to figure out how to do business in a way that is ethically um, viable, but also in a way um, that nourishing life is, is easy. Um, and that's actually what I think biomimicry gives us the possibility. Of. Nice. There's, there's something else that kept coming up for me as well in this and like, you know, we keep speaking about business as if it's this sort of thing in and of its own, but it's really just a collective term for a set of functions. 
and you know that in biomimicry is kind of the center of everything is we're looking at what functions we, we really want to achieve and you know when we started this whole talk we were looking at you know um, the idea of having a vocabulary that can help us resolve various kind of you know, conflicts and being able to actually achieve different things and I think that what's so important is this idea of a different vocabulary, a different way of looking at things. What are the functions that we're trying to achieve? Because when we just throw a bunch of terms in there, of course, you already kind of have, you know, a lot of people with their, you know, their backup and, you know, there's certain preconceived notions around, you know, business aspects. But um, when you actually kind of dig down past all of those names and you go into the ideas of, you know, what are the functions you're actually trying to achieve? It really opens up that solution space, which is so exciting. Yeah, it's critical. A lot of the people, the arguments around whether we should be doing one thing and the other thing is around the noun. No, we need a city. No, you need nature and wilderness. No, we need a city. No, we need wilderness. No, you need something that provides the opportunity for people to connect and you need the functions of healthy water, clean air, good healthy soil and human well-being. If you need those functions put together, what does that look like? Not city versus wilderness, but a city that functions like the wilderness or that brings in the wilderness because there's no way you're going to achieve that without using nature. So it's actually defining what you're trying to achieve by what you want your function to be is so important in everything um we get stuck in the nouns and the conflict and the ethics around no business versus this it's actually if you look at what you're both trying to achieve you'll find it's actually the same thing and you just have to figure out how does nature actually achieve both those at the same time and translate that into principles that you can apply in the way you design your world amazing um there was a question in here earlier pertaining specifically to um people wanting to connect on um biomimicry in the medical field, but I just wanted to say that there are, the field of biomimicry internationally is really growing and expanding all over the place. Um, and the Biomimicry Institute have a wonderful map of the global network, um, which is really exciting. And it allows you to actually connect with your regional um, local network, biomimicry network, which is very exciting. But of course, Feel free to connect with Biomimicry South Africa as well, and uh, we can very happily pass along any connections as well. Um, so my, my first port of call is normally going to the, the Biomimicry Institute website and look, when you look at that global map and it's, first of all, it's really exciting and second of all, it's quite informative. <laughs> yeah, and if you're interested in Biomimicry in the healthcare system, I've done quite a few. Um, the thing about Biomimicry is I, I I'll do a presentation on just nanotechnology. I'll do a presentation on just green building. I'll do a presentation on just business. I'll do a presentation on just healthcare. There's so many fields which applies. And yes, there's a lot of, of people working in the healthcare system. So you can email me directly. Um, I'll just put my email address there and I can connect you to those. But if you just want to connect with a local network, as, as Jay says, um, biomimicry.org, click on network and you'll find your local network there. Fantastic. Yeah, we have just, sorry, we have only five minutes. I don't know if anybody else wants to raise the hand and ask a question or comment or whatever suggestion. Please, you could unmute yourself. We have only a few minutes before to finish. Uh, Ismail, just... yes, Ismail is raising the hand. Thank Hi. you. Um, actually, I found out about this on Instagram, uh, on the biomimicry page, and I'm really glad I attended this because it's really uh, interesting for me to know more about biomimicry than just uh, what I thought it was, which is uh, since I'm studying civil engineering and I'm working on a thesis about uh, biomimicry and bionic design, uh, bio-inspired design, and it's interesting to know that there's more of it than just emulating um, nature genius as uh Bina says and uh more uh, of you know putting it into um systems in in uh, of thinking you know and uh, business solutions and i'm really i'm really glad i attended this i just wanted to thank you all and uh i would be interested if uh like to know how far we've come uh now in in the process of making biomimicry um a a process that is actively put into 
uh, uh, like, I don't know if it's uh, called governmental uh, plans or something like that, like how far are we on that? Like how serious is it taken into uh, um, policies uh, around the world? And thank you so much again. Yeah, thank you. Um, what I love about biomimicry is it's, it's such a new field. I mean, it's only a couple of decades old as an official current field. Yes, we have Leonardo da Vinci and Buckminster Fuller who did it as individuals, but now it's this field which we deliberately apply. And the level at which it's going to be applied in government and in business depends on people like yourself, you know, hearing it and thinking, hey, it's not being applied there, let's do something about it. So I, in South Africa, have had good success with um, the provincial government, with city and municipalities, um, and at a national level have started to bring it into the way we do management and the way we're thinking about other things. But that was because myself as an individual was driven to bring that into being. I have colleagues who were in the US EPA who drove to bring it into the US EPA. I have colleagues in um, Europe who try, strive to bring it in the Green New Deal and innovation. So. I, if we actually took a moment now and did an audit of all the places around the world, which is it's happening, it's because it's driven by champion individuals in those places and not because those places came to us, if that makes sense. So it's, it's like planting seeds and, and making sure they get nourished. But I love people in your position because you are the next person who will lead that next thing by the research that you do, by the way you communicate that, by the way that you engage with, with government when you have those opportunities. But my final point is I've realized is whenever government puts in a decision to implement something, somebody has to write the strategy for what they implement. And I've always positioned myself as one of those people who write the strategy. So do you want to be the president or do you want to be the person who writes the strategy the president implements? And that if you're an engineer, you're probably going to be the person who writes the strategy. So think about your, your role that you could play in helping to shift government, make those, those good decisions. Well, amazing. So much to learn, to, so much to, to read about. <laughs> and thank you, Leon. I want to ask Leon if you want to say something because you are there and so active. And thank you so much for your, yeah. thank your you. support. <laughs> I don't know where are you, but please open your phone and your microphone and say hi. Yeah, what a Yeah, champion. thanks for the call out. Um, my name's Leon, they, them pronouns. I'm currently based in California. Uh, this is definitely near and dear to my heart. I'm also a biomimicry professional. Um, I worked at Singularity University for the last two years. So happy to be supportive and a bit of a maven and providing resources for everyone. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. Somebody else want to say something or ask something? Or we move just want to say thank yeah. you so much. Very inspiring, very exciting. Um, busy doing your online course, Claire and Jessica and very keen to connect, to link up, to see how um, more of the good work that you're currently spreading in South Africa can be integrated. And um, yeah, thanks a lot. Nice to see you. Thank you. It's so exciting seeing all these names that we know. Like, Hi, guys. <laughs> <laughs> what we could do now, I think that everybody should uh, uh, get a, p uh, a pen and a piece of paper and write down the three things that you have learned today. I mean, I'm sure that everybody can, because we hear so many inspiring things all the time. Uh, what is it that you're gonna do today based on what Claire and Jessica and Belen have mentioned? This is so important to create changes as soon as you hear it. What SMS, where are you gonna be working in a, as a strategist? And so on that note, I think Belen will need to close, but please. Yes. Uh, okay, I will close the uh, wrap up the meeting. Thank you so much because I, I'm really happy to be here and I, I am really grateful for being part of this amazing movement that is Be Women. We are trying to work as a um, as this model that you say uh, the, the name was um, distributed. Distributed. This is the model, the model that we are trying to use in Be Women. So I'm really happy to be part of this. And thank you, Claire and Jessica, for all your wisdom, your knowledge, and share with with our community. It was really inspiring uh, that provide us a lot of tools to get out and find in nature awareness, uh, the, the answers to solve our problems. 
um, we have a beautiful challenge to learn from, from more than 30 million of species with 3.8 billion years of experience. So this is really, really exciting. And before closing, we would like to share with you the list of upcoming webinars in English. The next one will be June 11 at 2 p.m. Uh, London uh, time, UK time. Superpower of resilience. The speaker will be Sule Kuldai, executive coach, business consultant, and international keynote speaker. The, um, the other one will be June 12, 11 uh, New York time, meditation masterclass of the incredible effect in, of this practice. The speaker will be Susan Michelle Hill, founder of the OHM Center of Meditation for New York. And the other one will be June 23 at 2 p.m. UK time, the cost of global domestic violence, the invisible pandemic. We have the, the part one in our YouTube channel. If you go to our website, you can find it too. And this will be the second part. The speaker will be Jan Borges, founder of Women Humanity Foundation. To learn more about us, to find the other webinars, um, you, can visit, you could visit our website, bewomensolution.com, or follow us on our social networks, find us, Be Women Solution, in Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. And that's all. Looking forward to meet you in the next webinar. And thank you. Thank you so much, Claire and Jessica, and all of you for being there. And I don't know, Laura, if you want to say something else, or we can wrap up. I think this is wonderful. Thank you very much, everybody. It's Claire, Jessica, Mylen. This has been really amazing. Leo and everybody on the line. So please uh, join us at our other webinars because we we Be Women is all about distributive energy, distributive connections, and 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 building strategies to actually create changes in in uh, not only through climate change, but also through gender because that's the way we, we will solve, I think, the problems in the future. Uh, by solving gender, sorry, climate change is so through gender lens, we will see real changes in our society. Thank you all. Claire, Jess, do you want to say something to close? Thank you very much to you both and thank you for hosting us. Thank you. Jess? Can't really top that. Thank you. It's been wonderful. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, see you. see you soon. Goodbye Thank to you. everyone. Thank you.